Hi, um, welcome to Medicine Grand Rounds um, this week. Uh, I'm excited to welcome Dr. Pamela Allen to present to us today. Um, Dr. Allen is an assistant professor in the lymphoma program at the Winship Cancer Institute here at Emory. She uh, graduated from medical school at the University of Florida. Um, she did her uh, internal medicine residency at the University of Maryland and her fellowship um, in Hemonc at Northwestern University before joining us here at Emory. Her career here has been focused um, primarily on the treatment and outcomes of Hodgkin's and T-cell lymphomas. She's received a number of accolades, um, is a member or was inducted into the Gold Humanism Society, um, has won research and teaching awards, um, has, uh, has been accepted into the American Society of Hematology Clinical Research Training Institute, the Lymphoma Research Foundation Clinical Research and Mentoring Program, the Young Investigator Award from the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation, and a Career Development Award from the Lymphoma Research Foundation. Not many of us in this room treat lymphoma, but we certainly see a lot of patients with lymphoma. But many of those and um, many patients with other um, illnesses um, have been placed on checkpoint inhibitors uh, in this new era. We're seeing more and more immunosuppressed patients in all parts of our practice. And so um, I was really thrilled when Dr. Allen agreed to talk to us about checkpoint blockade, really focusing on the lymphoma um, piece but using that as illustrative of this really um, new-ish class of medications that uh, is really um, uh, becoming so um, uh, prevalent in many uh, parts of our uh, clinical world today. So thanks so much, Dr. Allen, for um, joining us. Um, as always, um, please um, uh, put questions into the chat, um, which we can address at the end. And uh, I look forward to your talk, Checkpoint Blockade, Focus on Classical Hodgkin's Lymphoma, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, I was asked to reflect a little bit on, on my journey and provide a personal anecdote. Um, and as I was preparing for this presentation, I was reflecting on where I was when I began this journey around 2009. And it was actually one of the lowest points in my life. I was a third year medical student at the University of Florida and I had just lost my sister tragically and shortly thereafter, my husband and I separated, and I was very pregnant with my daughter, Avery. I was completely lost and was supposed to decide my future in medicine um, and was also facing the reality of life as a single parent. Up until that point, I had made most of my decisions based on what was expected of me, what I thought would make others happy, and I hadn't really taken the time to consider what I wanted for myself. So that I was staring down my fourth year with no direction and a little human being inside of me, a very sage advisor recommended that I spend a month not on the specialty that I thought I wanted to pursue, but with a person I admired. So I ended up spending an elective in oncology with Dr. Jay Lynch, who happened to be an oncologist specializing in lymphoma. With all that had happened to me in medical school, it's fair to say I didn't exactly kill it during most of my rotations, but with Dr. Lynch, I was treated as a human being, not just an annoyance, and he was really the first person to make me feel like I had the potential to be a great doctor, and in him, I saw the type of physician that I wanted to become. I found the humanity and compassion that was lacking in my prior rotations, and I saw the meaning behind medicine and the direct impact of science and research, and I decided at that point I would become an oncologist. And as luck would have it, I eventually found my way around to lymphoma as well. Certainly, the struggle didn't stop there. Um, as many of you with kids can imagine, being a single parent to a one-year-old, my intern year was a little bit crazy. And I'll never forget the look on my program director's face when I asked her the logistics of raising a child alone during residency. If there's anything that I can say, especially to trainees, it would be first to treat each other and yourselves with kindness. Everyone has a story and a struggle. Kindness costs nothing and can make such a tremendous impact as someone who's suffering. The second is to think about the long game. I didn't get into the best residency, um, but I chose a program that suited my needs. It was an NCCN Comprehensive Cancer Center, and it was near my family where I grew up. By being very deliberate and strategic in my choice of mentors and projects, I was able to get a few publications, some residency awards, and build the type of relationships that led to a very strong fellowship application. And lastly, at the risk of sounding very cliche, I'll just say that hard work always pays off. It might not be in the ways you anticipate, 
It might not be in the timeline you expect, but eventually, if you stick around long enough, the work will pay you back. It was only just a few months ago that I was all but ready to give up on this dream of mine to be a successful academic clinical researcher. I was working on this grueling grant process, and I honestly thought that my application sucked and I was about to withdraw it, but I submitted it. And in November, I'm proud to say I was awarded a career development award through a very competitive process. And I later learned that I was actually one of the top two scores. This grant has opened the door to so many new opportunities for me, but it would never have been possible if I hadn't put in 10 years of hard work and reached out to mentors at various points in my career for help. So in that context, I'm excited to share with you a topic I'm very passionate about, immunotherapy and Hodgkin lymphoma. And the, talk, the title of my talk is uh, Checkpoint Blockade, Focus on Classical Hodgkin Lymphoma, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. So I'm going to start out with a couple of uh, real clinical cases. The first is a 25-year-old male who had no prior medical history and presented with exertional dyspnea and night sweats. An x-ray was performed by a primary care provider that demonstrated mediastinal widening, and he was sent to the emergency room. Additional workup subsequently showed a 12-centimeter large mediastinal mass, and a biopsy was performed consistent with classical Hodgkin lymphoma nodular sclerosing subtype. He was referred to oncology to complete staging workup and discuss treatment options. This is an uh, one of the images of his pretreatment pet, and you can see a very large mediastinal mass with extension into the axilla, uh, bilateral axillary involvement, supraclavicular, and, uh, uh, and uh, bilateral cervical. So you can imagine why this patient was so symptomatic. So he ultimately decided to enroll on my clinical trial uh, that included anti-PD-1 uh, therapy with pembrolizumab followed by chemotherapy with ABD. Following the first dose of pembrolizumab, he actually had complete resolution of his shortness of breath and was able to ride his bike. A PET scan was performed per protocol after just three doses of pembrolizumab, and this is the response. So you can see he's had near complete resolution of this very large mediastinal mass with just three doses of pembrolizumab. Uh, he went on per protocol to then receive four cycles of ABD chemotherapy, and he remains in remission to this day. So moving on to clinical case number two. So this is a 21-year-old male who had a history of classical Hodgkin lymphoma. He was treated with ABVD and planned consolidated radiotherapy, but unfortunately relapsed in the middle of radiation treatment. He was then treated with salvage chemotherapy followed by high-dose uh, chemotherapy and stem cell rescue and initially did achieve a complete remission, but relapsed within three months of completing therapy. He was treated on a clinical trial with nivolumab, ipilimumab, and brintuximab bedotin. After the fourth cycle, or about four months into therapy, he started complaining of nausea, vomiting, loose stools, and abdominal bloating with poor appetite. An EGD was performed and it showed severe gastritis. Biopsy demonstrated inflamed gastric mucosa with ulceration and increased epi uh, intraepithelial lymphocytes consistent with immune-related gastritis. So the therapy was held and he was treated supportively. His symptoms actually completely resolved and so he was restarted on cl clinical trial therapy and received an ad additional six months of therapy, ultimately leading to a complete remission of his disease. But unfortunately, during cycle 12, he began experiencing increasing symptoms of dyspnea on exertion. He had a dry cough um, and a little bit of chest pain, but no fevers. And this is his chest x-ray at that point in time, which shows um, bilateral um, infiltrates. So he was started on prednisone at a MIG per keg, and symptoms rapidly improved within 48 hours. And so then uh, his prednisone was, was slowly tapered. Unfortunately, once the prednisone started to be tapered, his symptoms returned, and a repeat chest x-ray was performed. This is just three weeks after the first chest x-ray, and you can see significant progression of the disease involving the lungs. So he was admitted to the hospital for additional workup. He was found to be hypoxic. Infectious workup was negative. Bronchoscopy was performed that showed thickened alveolar walls with reactive pneumocyte hyperplasia, suggestive of acute lung injury. And um, ultimately, he was diagnosed with immune-mediated pneumonitis. <clears throat> 
he was placed back on prednisone uh, one meg per keg, but unfortunately developed acute respiratory failure, bilateral pneumothoraces requiring chest tubes, and ultimately died in the hospital from pneumonitis. So I think those two trials um, first illustrate kind of the good and the, the bad side of checkpoint inhibitors. My learning objectives for this talk are to describe the mechanism of action of checkpoint inhibitors in oncology, to recognize and manage immune-related adverse events associated with checkpoint inhibitors, and to review some clinical trial data supporting the use of checkpoint inhibitors, focusing specifically on some of my data in classical Hodgkin lymphoma. So first, I wanted to just take a little bit of a step back um, just to remind everyone why the world, and particularly in oncology, we're so excited about checkpoint inhibitors. So you all have probably heard about the story of Jimmy Carter, who was treated with checkpoint blockade and was able to go into a complete remission when he really had no other options. And then the Nobel Prize winners in 2018 were awarded due to uh, building the foundation that led to um, checkpoint inhibitors and ultimately led to drug development. When we look at the time limit of an immunotherapy, it's actually not that new. We first started developing immunotherapy back in 2010 with um, an FDA-approved cancer vaccine called Cipulucil T. You probably haven't heard of it, but it is actually still used for prostate cancer with moderate efficacy. Then the first checkpoint inhibitor was actually approved in 2011. That was ipilimumab that was uh, approved for metastatic melanoma. Two additional checkpoint inhibitors, pembrolizumab and nivolumab, were approved for melanoma in 2014. In 2015, uh, another type of immunotherapy, an oncolytic virus called TVEC, was approved. And then moving to 2016, they have four more checkpoint inhibitors that were approved to treat a variety of cancers. And one of the biggest breakthroughs came in May of 2017 when the FDA designated the first what we call site agnostic approval. Um, and this was for pembrolizumab in any type of tumor that had a certain genetic feature called um, microsatellite instability or mismatch uh, repair deficiency. And this was really revolutionary and one step closer to uh, personalized medicine in oncology that's not specific to any uh, type of tumor. So this is just a, a, just a general overview of the FDA-approved checkpoint inhibitors. We've got CTLA-4 uh, antibodies, PD-1, of course, with pembrolizumab and nivolumab, and also antibodies targeting um, the ligand uh, PD-L1. And checkpoint inhibitors have actually had a huge impact on cancer mortality. Um, recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine, as well as several press releases, has shown that there's been a, actually a record drop in U.S. cancer death rate. And this has been largely due to the FDA appro approval of checkpoint inhibitors and their role in lung cancer. And as these drugs become more and more widely available, you can see that there's more patients that are receiving them and, and more patients that are able to have a response to immunotherapy. But there is still this gap between uh, patients that are eligible for checkpoint inhibitors and those that respond, which definitely represents an unmet need. So now I want to move on to looking a little bit at the mechanism of checkpoint blockade, and then I'm going to focus a little bit more on some of the toxicities. So I'm going to use Hodgkin's uh, as a reference point. So in the middle, we see uh, a, a typical Hodgkin Reed Sternberg cell. On the left, we see factors that lead to um, inhibition of the Reed Sternberg cell, and on the right, factors that lead to uh, factors that lead to expansion. And that there's always this balance um, in oncology in general. It's really an immunologic process. So Reed Sternberg cells, just like other malignancies, are able to express certain proteins on their cell service that actually in some ways uh, cloaks them or makes them invisible um, to, uh, to the immune system. One of these types of proteins is PD-L1, um, which, uh, which can basically dampen uh, T cell response. And on the right side, um, we see that in addition to dampening the response of cytotoxic cells against the Reed-Sternberg cell. It also creates an immune niche where it uh, selectively secretes certain molecules that expand um, certain immune elements that actually promote the growth of the Hodgkin Reed-Sternberg cell. 
and in looking in general at the immunologic response, it really is this cyclical process where initially you have priming and activation of antigen presenting cells that present tumor specific antigens to T cells. Those T cells then traffic um, to the tumors where they're able to infiltrate into the tumors. They recognize the cancer um, due to uh, that cancer specific antigen. They're then able to exert their effect, um, causing um, cytotoxicity to these cancer cells, which then releases more antigen. Those tumor antigens are then taken up by dendritic and antigen-presenting cells, starting the cycle again. So looking at immune checkpoints, again, using um, Hodgkin's as a reference point, on the far left graphic, we see an antigen presenting cell, and this is how things should normally act. Um, antigen presenting cells typically present an antigen through their MHC complex. And, um, and that MHC complex and antigen presents to a T cell receptor on a T cell. T cell receptors have co-stimulatory and co-inhibitory molecules. Um, if the co-stimulatory molecule is activated um, following binding of the co-stimulatory, in this case, UD28 and B7, the T cell is then activated. What oftentimes happens in cancers like Hodgkin's is when this um, antigen presenting complex on the cancer cell presents, uh, presents to the T cell receptor on the T cell, Instead, instead of binding to the co-stimulatory um, and activating the T cell, the, the co-inhibitory molecules are bound uh, by the PD ligands that are expressed on the surface of the Reed-Sternberg cell um, to the PD-1 molecule on the T cells, and this actually leads to dampening of the T cell response. And the way that uh, PD-1 blockade works, if you look at the graphic on the far right, um, these uh, antibodies actually bind to the PD ligand, uh, to the PD-1 molecule in this case that is on the T cell. Therefore, when the Hodgkin Reed Sternberg presents its antigen to the T cell, it is unable to activate that uh, inhibitory pathway, uh, thus allowing the T cell to exert its impact. So now I'm going to move on a little bit to the diagnosis and management of immune-related adverse events, focusing on a couple of the common scenarios as well as some of the most dangerous. So in general, when we think about immune-related adverse events, this is always a balancing act. The whole point of immunotherapy is that we're trying to activate the immune response against the tumor cells. Unfortunately, this can sometimes be nonspecific, and that's how you can have autoimmune reactions um, because of decreased immune tolerance. It's important to note that with immune-related adverse events, any organ can be involved. It can occur at any time and even months after therapy was started or even after therapy has been discontinued. I'm going to be focusing on CTLA-4 and anti-PD-1, although there are other checkpoint inhibitors um, that are in development. Um, CTLA-4, which is typically ipilimumab, is associated with a higher rate of immune adverse events, up to 60 to 85 percent, and more of these are high grade compared to anti-PD-1, um, but anti-PD-1 antibody is also associated with high rates, um, but high grade uh, adverse events are much less common, uh, representing less than 20 percent. Again, uh, you, these can affect really any organ system in the body. Combination therapy definitely increases risk and severity, and remember that risk persists for months after discontinuation. So I oftentimes think about immune-related toxicities in terms of what's the most common, what's less common, and what's potentially life-threatening. So in the most common, uh, most of you will probably never see, uh, you know, fevers, chills, and infusion reactions because most of these patients don't need to be admitted to the hospital. It happens with the first dose, and it's self-limited. Um, dermatologic and, and GI uh, side effects are also very common. These tend to occur early, usually within the first two months of therapy, but are usually low-grade. But you can also get hepatic and, and endocrine side effects, particularly hypothyroidism, Endocrine side effects are, are one of the few side effects that is not reversible, and usually these patients do need to be on long-term uh, replacement, uh, whether it's for, for thyroid or diabetes. Less common but potentially severe side effects include um, hematologic, uh, hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, ocular manifestations, nephritis, pancreatitis, neuropathy, and gastritis. 
and potentially life-threatening includes pneumonitis, cardiovascular side effects, particularly myocarditis and um, adrenal insufficiency. The onset of immune-related adverse events varies depending on the type of side effects. So again, rash and diarrhea tend to occur very early, whereas the endocrine, liver, and pneumonitis side effects tend to occur later. But any of these can occur at any time. So noting that the patient has a history of being on one of these agents is the most relevant. So this is, again, reiterating, um, you know, immune-related adverse events are always on the differential, but this is a diagnosis of exclusion. You still need to make sure that you do a thorough workup. These can affect any organ system, and that early recognition, evaluation, evaluation and treatment are really critical. So when we talk about immune-related adverse events, as oncologists, we usually use this common terminology criteria for adverse events, or CTCAE. You can think about these, though, very generally. Um, grade one to two is considered low grade. These are patients that are going to have mild to moderate symptoms. There's almost never hospitalization required, and these patients usually can be managed symptomatically with either continuing therapy or very briefly holding. High grade is grade three to four. These are severe or life-threatening adverse events. These require admission to the hospital for observation almost always. Sorry, <laughs> my light's turned off. Um, and uh, and they, uh, they, generally, they generally always require high-dose steroids, and then grade five is death. So looking at a little bit more detail, so for grade one here, you can see you treat symptomatically. There's no systemic uh, steroids that are needed. You do not need to hold study treatment. Grade one, uh, for selected adverse events, you might need some steroids. Um, the study treatment is usually withheld in this situation. For grade three and four, you always get systemic steroids. You always hold therapy. And for grade four, it's oftentimes permanently discontinued unless it's due to an endocrine immune-related adverse event. But it's also important to note that even with patients with grade two, if this is persistent or recurring, you oftentimes might need steroids in that situation as well. So moving on to what I consider some of the bad side effects. So dermatologic immune-related adverse events are some of the most common side effects that you'll see. They occur early, often after the first cycle of therapy, but can occur late too. Um, pruritus in the absence of rash can actually occur in up to a third of cases. And there have been some reported cases of Stephen Johnson syndrome and even toxic ep epidermal necrolysis. So here are some images of, of some of the um, side effects you might see. So on the top two, um, A and B, is a patient with a maculopapular rash. This is the most common dermatologic manifestation. And then underneath, you can see a patient that's got vitiligo with some uh, loss or, dis or hypopigmentation right around the lips um, and on the, the lower back. The treatment for, the, for patients with low grade is really just topicals, low um, potency to medium potency steroids, and antihistamines if indicated. So here is what some of the higher grade skin toxicities can look like. On the left two pictures, you can see a grade three maculopapular eruption, and on the right, you can see a grade four Stevens-Johnson syndrome. So although this is relatively rare, this can occur in up to 4% of pa patients. And again, for, for these severe toxicities, you always hold treatment and give systemic glucocorticoids. So this is an algorithm for how I think about dermatologic um, adverse events. So for patients that have um, uh, less than um, 10 to 20% BSA involvement, you typically can continue therapy, manage symptomatically with just topicals. And um, these patients do not need to be hospitalized. Um, for patients that have uh, more moderate symptoms, in these scenarios, you typically need to hold the agents, call dermatology, see about doing a biopsy, and you're going to start oral steroids typically at 0 0.5 to 1 mg per keg, and also give um, outpatient uh, topical therapy as well. For more severe manifestations, you oftentimes will need to discontinue the agent permanently. Uh, dermatologic evaluation is required, higher doses of oral steroids, and aggressive topical treatments. So moving on to another common side effect, uh, which is uh, gastrointestinal diarrhea or colitis. 
So the presentation for, um, for this can be uh, abdominal pain, fever, rectal bleeding, and sometimes peritoneal signs. This does typically occur early, um, around after the third infusion. And though usually it's relatively mild and easy to treat, about 1% of patients can have a fatal uh, bowel perforation, and some patients are refractory to steroids. This is definitely more common with ipilimumab and with combination therapy. Uh, you always need to work up these patients thoroughly, rule out infection, C. diff, and side effects from medications. So this is how I think about approaching patients with diarrhea or colitis. Grade one patients are those that have less than four stools per day or asymptomatic colitis that's only seen on imaging. These patients can be observed outpatient, just routine stool and blood work, and you can give antidiarrheals. Uh, for patients that have grade two, there's four to six stools a day. There's more abdominal pain, uh, blood, and mucus. These patients need a more complete workup, including inflammatory markers. You do not want to give an antidiarrheal agent in this case. And for patients that are diagnosed with colitis, you would start them on IV methylprednisolone. Uh, these patients um, may need a hospitalization, particularly for colitis. And then patients that have grade three to four have diarrhea um, that's typically more than six, whoops, uh, more than six stools per day. Uh, or that require IV fluids for more than 24 hours, or that their symptoms are interfering with um, ADLs, colitis with more severe pain, ileus or fever, or even grade four bowel perforation. These patients typically always need to be hospitalized, uh, need uh, a complete workup, um, consult GI, endoscopy, imaging, and um, methylprednisolone IV, and in some patients, they even need to add additional anti-inflammatory agents such as infliximab. So note that once patients have improvement of symptoms down to a grade zero, you can start the taper of steroids, but this needs to be a long taper. And some patients can get rebound diarrhea once you start tapering. So in those patients, you need to be very careful monitoring closely, and you might need to go back up on the dose of steroids. You also need to definitely make sure to include supportive care with the medications. You can re-initiate uh, loperamide once infection has been ruled out. All right, so moving on to what I would consider the ugly. So one of the dreaded complications uh, of Im immunotherapy is pneumonitis. And one of the reasons that it's dreaded is the presentation sometimes can be very subtle. His patients can sometimes just have a little bit of a dry cough. It might be a little bit more progressive. Sometimes they'll have some dyspnea on exertion. And less commonly, they'll have pleuritic chest pain or fever. Uh, you really need to have a very high end of suspicion in these patients um, because they, they won't often have lots of obvious signs. Um, and key uh, early intervention is absolutely key. Of course, you need to complete a full workup for these patients. Differential includes pneumonia, radiation pneumonitis, or progressive disease. And although relatively rare, this occurs in one out of 20 patients treated with immune checkpoint uh, inhibitors and can be fatal. Again, these, the diagnosis of this is, is absolutely critical. You have to have a high index of suspicion. You should be consulting pulmonology early. And for patients, even with a, a grade two there, we recommend the immediate initiation of, of corticosteroids. As patients typically need to be on high dose IV steroids um, for, and have to be on a longer taper. You can't just um, take them off quickly. This taper is typically over four to six weeks, depending on the grade. And for grade three to four, you always have to permanently discontinue therapy. So looking a little bit closer at the management um, algorithm, so grade one pneumonitis is patients that are totally asymptomatic and have radiographic changes only. This is the rare group that you can consider just delaying therapy and monitoring really closely, but you do need to re-image these patients frequently. Grade two is, is uh, patients that just have mild to moderate symptoms in combination with imaging findings. These patients have to have their therapy delayed, uh, pulmonary and ID consults early on, monitor for symptoms daily, and started on steroids quickly and consider bronchoscopy. For patients with grade three to four, you need to permanently discontinue therapy. These patients always need to be hospitalized. They're started on uh, oftentimes even higher doses of steroids. 
Um, these patients typically should have a bronchoscopy and a lung biopsy. Once these patients improve, you can start um, to consider tapering um, for patients with grade three to four. If they don't improve after 48 hours or if they're wor worsening, you need to have a low threshold to consider adding additional immunosuppressive agents because those patients are at high risk for dying uh, from their disease. So moving on to myocarditis. So this wasn't originally very well appreciated because it's a little bit more rare of a side effect, but there's been more and more data that's been accumulating. And on this graph to the right, you can see the cases and fatality rates. And you can see that myositis and myocarditis are some of the le less common, but myocarditis in particular has one of the highest fatality r rates of any immune-related adverse event with near 50% of patients dying from this disease. So this was a, a case report that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine that demonstrated a patient that had presented with myocarditis that was biopsy proven um, and demonstrated that the presentation can be really variable. Patients can have a little bit of chest pain, shortness of breath, presyncope, but then they can have rapid progression with heart failure and malignant arrhythmias with EKGs in this case showing ventricular um, tachycardia. The biopsy in this case showed lymphocytic infiltration into the myocardium that was uh, really composed entirely of T cells, CD3 positive and CD8 positive. It was completely negative for B cells. The inflammation only affected the striated muscle, which is what is involved in, in cardiac and skeletal muscles and did not affect the smooth muscle at all. And unfortunately, this patient did die of myocarditis. So this is how um, I think a little bit about the, the algorithm for the workup and treatment. So first question always is whether or not they're on immunotherapy. If they have acute symptoms, you want to kind of just go ahead and treat them uh, presumptively for uh, myocarditis. Um, if, if their symptoms are, are relatively mild, um, you want to just do a general cardiac workup to start with with an EKG and troponin. If this is abnormal and you have uh, an index of suspicion, uh, you want to go ahead and admit this patient, stop therapy, consult cardiology. And one of the things that's unique about myocarditis is, um, first of all, you hold therapy for all grades, grade one to four, and then you permanently discontinue therapy for grade two or higher. Uh, and you want to administer high-dose corticosteroids early on for, for just about all grades of myocarditis, given the very high uh, incidence of mortality. And lastly, I want to talk just a little bit about adrenal insufficiency, because this is another one that's very difficult to diagnose if you're not thinking of it. The symptoms can be very nonspecific, sometimes just a little bit of weakness or nausea. They can have abdominal pain, fever, vomiting, which, as you can imagine, are common side effects for lots of cancer patients. Um, and patients that have adrenal crisis, they'll present in shock uh, with hypo, uh, hypotension, hypovolemia, vomiting, uh, coma, electrolyte imbalances. Specifically for hypophysitis, patients can present with a little bit of a headache. Uh, primary adrenal insufficiency versus secondary adrenal insufficiency have a little bit different um, uh, workup and, and uh, slightly different treatment. Um, secondary adrenal insufficiency is typically due to hypophysitis. So this is how I think of working up adrenal insufficiency. So obviously, first, is the patient on immunotherapy? Is there a concern? Um, are the patients stable versus unstable? If they're in adrenal crisis or presenting with hypovolemia shock, you want to immediately discontinue therapy, rule out sepsis, start stress dose steroids um, immediately, and consult endocrine. For patients where you have a little bit more time, um, think about whether or not you're more concerned for primary versus secondary adrenal insufficiency. Uh, for hypophysitis, oftentimes patients will have uh, headaches. Um, the workup generally for these patients includes imaging of the pituitary and the adrenals, as well as labs that should largely be directed by endocrine. If patients have abnormal um, pituitary or brain MRI imaging, you're going to go ahead and delay therapy, start them on steroids, um, as well as appropriate hormone replacement. Um, if their uh, MRI and pituitary are normal and, um, and you know, symptoms are otherwise mild, then oftentimes they can be followed. But if symptoms persist, you often might need to repeat blood testing. So in summary, immune-related adverse events uh, should be suspected in any patient with new symptoms on or previously receiving checkpoint blockade. These can affect any organ system 
Workup should be done to rule out other causes. Patients with minimal symptoms can often be observed with symptom-guided therapy only, uh, whereas patients with more severe symptoms require admission and prompt initiation of systemic corticosteroids, and oftentimes this can be done while you're in the midst of the workup. Pneumonitis and especially myocarditis have subtle findings but high rates of fatality and warrant high index of suspicion and prompt investigations. So now I'm going to talk a little bit more about my area of expertise, which is immunotherapy and classical Hodgkin's lymphoma, so so-called the good. So classical Hodgkin's lymphoma from a bird's eye view, this is uh, a transection of a lymph node. And you can see that um, these malignant Reinsternberg cells, which is uh, outlined on the right, are, are actually relatively rare in the tumor itself. And it's really in this sea of inflammatory infiltrate, which suggests that there's a very extensive but ineffective immune response, which also suggests that if you could just turn on the immune response, that immunotherapy would be a very promising uh, therapy for these patients. So about 10 years ago, when they were looking at um, the genomic signature of classical Hodgkin's, they noticed that um, compared to diffuse large B cell lymphoma, there was specific genes um, that were amplified, and one of these was, was on chromosome 9P24.1. And why is that important? So chromosome 9P24.1 encodes for PD ligands 1 and 2. Uh, as well as JAK2, which actually acts in a feedback loop to subsequently increase expression of PD ligands. So then, not surprisingly, um, the in increase in PD, uh, the increase in 9P24.1 alterations correlated directly with increased PD ligand tr transcript abundance. And furthermore, when they looked at um, the range of genomic alterations in chromosome 9P from disomy, which means normal copy number, all the way to amplification, which means multiple excess copies, they saw that there was increased staining of PD ligand 1 on the Hodgkin Reed Sternberg cells, which is demonstrated below by the brown outline. So they found that PD ligand was expressed on all Hodgkin Reed Sternberg cells but it was particularly highly expressed um, in increased density in patients that had amplification. And amplifications were also noted to be more common in patients with advanced stage. Here we can see, um, looking by stage, the different types of genomic alterations in classical Hodgkin's, and there's two things that I want to point out. The first is that you can see that amplification becomes more common with increasing stage. But the second is if you look at that tiny black bar at the top, which represents diazomy, which is a normal cell copy number for 9P, you can see that there's almost no patients that only had diazomy, meaning that nearly 100% of Hodgkin lymphoma patients have some kind of alteration of chromosome 9P. So in summary, chromosome 9P contains the coding regions for PDL1 and PDL2. These alterations are identified in nearly all classical Hodgkin's cases and correlate with ubiquitous expression of PD ligand 1 on Hodgkin Reed Sternberg cells. I want to point out that this is unique to Hodgkin's. This is rarely seen in other types of malignancies. Uh, 9P24.1 amplifications are associated with the highest density of PD ligand staining, and these amplifications are more common in advanced stage, ultimately leading to a very strong rationale for PD1 blockade in classical Hodgkin's lymphoma. So not surprisingly, with that data, um, both uh, nivolumab and pembrolizumab, which are anti-PD-1 antibodies, demonstrated exceptional efficacy in this disease. On the right, you can see the FDA approval of both of these agents and um, the graph showing uh, almost all patients had at least some tumor shrinkage. The overall response rate was uh, close to 70% for both patients, which is the highest that's seen in just about any malignancy. So overall, this uh, led to our hypothesis for use of frontline pembrolizumab. So we hypothesized that previously untreated classical Hodgkin lymphoma would have increased rates of complete response compared to relapsed patients when treated with a brief course of single-agent pembrolizumab, and that sequential therapy with ABD, uh, AVD would be safe and efficacious. So I wrote this clinical trial as a fellow while I was at Northwestern, 
and this looked at sequential pembrolizumab and AVD and was a multi-center uh, study including Northwestern, Stanford, Rutgers, and subsequently we added on Emory once I joined here as faculty. The eligibility included patients with newly diagnosed classical Hodgkin lymphoma. They had to be either early stage with one risk factor or advanced stage. And again, our primary endpoint was to look at the complete response rate to single agent pembrolizumab in the frontline setting, predicting a doubling of complete response rate in the frontline compared to the relapse setting. Our target accrual was 80, uh, sorry, was 30 patients. And our study schema included a single agent pembrolizumab for three doses, followed by a PET2 for our primary endpoint, which was reviewed centrally. Patients then went on to receive four to six cycles of AVD chemotherapy, depending on stage and bulk. We demonstrated um, excellent responses. So this first bar graph was our primary endpoint to look at the single agent efficacy of pembrolizumab. You can see there was a 97% overall response rate. Only one patient didn't respond. And um, we were just one patient shy of, of achieving our primary endpoint, with, which was a predicted 40% um, complete response rate. We were at 37. But following just two doses of ABD, 100 of percent of patients uh, converted to a complete response, and this was maintained at end of therapy. We also looked in a little bit more detail at the depth of response in these patients, and this is uh, the change in total metabolic tumor volume uh, following single-agent pembrolizumab, and you can see that the majority of patients had greater than 90% decrease in their overall tumor volume. But most importantly, at the end of therapy, we achieved 100% progression-free survival and overall survival um, with a median follow-up of 22.5 months. And on the right, you can see this was a patient I presented earlier that had a complete response to single-agent pembrolizumab. And that patient remains in remission to this day. Therapy was really very well tolerated. Um, we saw just a handful of immune-related toxicities. Um, these were largely infusion reactions in three patients that were low grade, but there was one patient that had um, a, a higher grade uh, LFT abnormality, but this was treated with steroids and completely resolved. And subsequently, this has been, uh, this was accepted for publication in blood, um, and this is uh, now published online. So in summary, sequential pembrolizumab and AVD was highly efficacious in newly diagnosed classical Hodgkin lymphoma, leading to 100% complete response, progression-free survival, and overall survival at nearly two years follow-up. Toxicity was minimal, and there's now a large multi-center phase two company-sponsored uh, trial that's assessing this approach. So in conclusion, immunotherapy with checkpoint blockade is increasingly common. Immune-related adverse events are common, can, appoint, uh, can occur at any point in management, affect any organ system, and require a high index of suspicion. But also, when in doubt, ask. No one expects uh, a general internist to remember all of these uh, toxicities, and, and we should always be available to help. So I want to acknowledge my many amazing mentors at Northwestern and Emory, including Jane Winter, Leo Gordon, Barbara Pro, Mary Jo Lekowitz, Chris Flowers, Christy Bloom, and Jonathan Cohen, my amazing team at Winship, um, Dr. Zawana Coco, Mandawa, and Kuchikar, who helped uh, contribute some slides to this presentation, and also the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation um, for their Young Investigator Award, the Lymphoma Research Foundation for uh, Career Development Award, and the American Society of Hematology um, for a, a two-year uh, training program. But most of all, I need to thank my family. This is a picture of my mom and my daughter in the middle, who, without whom none of this would be possible. And especially thanks to my daughter for allowing me um, time away from her to, to work on these kinds of uh, presentations. And one of the ways that we've gotten through COVID, number one, is sending her to private school because I realized I couldn't be full-time mom, nanny, teacher. Um, but also this is our COVID puppy, standard poodle named Bon Bon. So I thank you all for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks so much um, for that talk and uh, these wonderful pictures at the end. Um, uh, I wanna remind everybody to feel free to put questions um, into the chat. 
Um, I have to tell you that like through the first half of your talk, I was thinking that checkpoint inhibitors were really, really terrifying. And then you showed the yeah. amazing data, um, the Hodgkin's data that you just showed. Is there any way to predict who might be at increased risk for um, immune related adverse outcomes, adverse events? Yeah, that's that's a really good. Um, sorry, my light keeps turning off. I, I guess I'm st sitting too still. Um, that's a really good question. There's, there's there certainly are studies that are trying to look into um, whether or not we can find biomarkers for who's likely uh, to develop these toxicities. Uh, I have not seen one that has been very well appreciated, other than certainly in combination. And there are certain checkpoint inhibitors that seem to have a higher risk. And then patients that have underlying autoimmune conditions are certainly at higher risk. Um, we've we've also looked to see whether you know having a totally competent immune system versus patients that are multiply relapsed. If there's a difference there, does, there doesn't really seem to be so far. All right. And um, from uh, Dr. Law, she was uh, uh, noting that really the approach often then for patients who are on checkpoint inhibitors that come to the emergency room um, with symptoms, um, or particularly inflammatory symptoms, often um, get high dose solumedrol quickly. Um, uh, is that like, do you recommend sort of that approach given the, the, the potential severity of these um, more severe um, uh, uh, manifestations or uh, is there? Yeah, I, I th yeah, I think that there's always this worry that if, you know, if you give steroids, are you going to be compromising the efficacy, you know, of these agents? And so I think that's a lot of where that question comes in. But I think if the patient's presenting to the emergency room, they've already pretty much declared themselves as a stage, as a, as a grade three for the most part. So unless this really seems to be very self-limited, very minimally symptomatic, if it's just like a skin only. I don't think it's wrong, you know, particularly if you're worried about um, adrenal insufficiency or pneumonitis or, or especially myocarditis to, to treat them early. And as an infectious disease doctor, um, I'm obviously always worried about infectious complications. We um, know with Ipilimumab, for example, to, um, that often there's an increased risk of pneumocystis, although that may be more steroid related than otherwise. Are there particular um, infectious complications that you see? And if so, are they specific to the drug or to the class overall? Yeah, a lot of times the, the infectious complications that we see are patients that have underlying immune dysregulation um, and the, the combination of that and if they're on prolonged steroids. So anyone that's going to be on a prolonged steroid course is always recommended to be on prophylaxis, which I didn't actually touch on in this talk, but, but we generally do recommend those patients to be on prophylaxis. I've certainly seen patients develop PCP pneumonia, um, uh, you know, and, and that, that being, I think, one of the more worrisome infections that we've seen. Um, and so um, my colleague, Dr. Del Rio asks, how do you, given the huge benefits potentially and some of the risks, how do you have the risk benefit conversations with your patients? <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I think, well, part of it, so I, I'm in a little bit of a different space. Um, so I'll, I'll start off by saying that um, I treat I treat Hodgkin's and um, patients, this is FDA approved for Hodgkin's right now in the relapse setting. So the only time that we're using it in frontline is as part of a clinical trial. So there's two different scenarios. When, when as part of the clinical trial, we actually were substituting pembrolizumab for what we consider to be a more toxic agent, bleomycin, in the frontline setting. So patients had the opportunity to have exposure to immunotherapy. We knew that it had an excellent efficacy. Um, and they were, and we were eliminating one of the more toxic agents. So most patients in that scenario actually came to us because they were excited for the opportunity for checkpoint blockade. But I think it is important in a highly curable disease like Hodgkin's to really talk about the risks of long-term side effects because patients, even you know, though we consider endocrine side effects to be relatively mild, they're permanent. So a patient gets hypothyroidism, they're on thyroid replacement for the rest of their life. Um, so we, we definitely talked about those side effects, um, but, but most patients during that, that um, pre-treatment phase with pembrolizumab only, they felt wonderful. And then once they moved on to the chemotherapy, they were like, what happened? <laughs> I was feeling so good. That's amazing. 
Um, uh, Dr. Taj is asking, what's the tipping point to stop immunotherapy in the setting of suspected pneumonitis? I mean, early, uh, early. Um, you know, I, I've just, I've seen, you know, this, this was a patient that I, that I took care of. Um, it wasn't my patient, but I took care of them in the hospital that died of pneumonitis. And I, you know, in patients that have any symptoms at all, I stop therapy um, and I very rarely, unless there's really no other alternatives, would restart immunotherapy in that setting. The only scenario where you consider continuing therapy is in that grade one. But in, even in that situation where if it's a grade one, I, I probably would still refer them to pulmonology, have them do a bronch. If they diagnose pneumonitis, even if it's asymptomatic, oftentimes even in that situation, I'll think about stopping therapy if there's a good alternative. Great. Um, thank you. Any other questions out there? All right. Uh, any role for plasmapheresis in patients with life-threatening immune adverse events? I have not seen data for plasmapheresis in this setting so far. And I think that's largely because we think about plasmapheresis in B cell mediated problems, usually because we're trying to like get rid of the antibody. And because this is largely mediated by T cells, I don't know that plasmapheresis necessarily has a role. Okay. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you also for your introduction. I hope you scroll back in the chat and see some of the um, comments um, from people. Um, congratulations on your award, but uh, thank you for sort of sharing your journey, which uh, really um, uh, adds a lot of humanity to the presentations that we hear. Um, uh, and with that, I guess I will close Grand Rounds for this week and um, see everyone next week. All right, thank you.